So today we're gonna to talk about the charismatic movement in the United States. Uh, we're gonna begin in the 1960s when it began. Uh, we're gonna talk about the Catholic charismatic renewal. And we're also gonna talk about the Jesus movement. And the picture that you see up on, well, pictures that you see up on the screen, on the left is a picture of uh, a baptism at the Pacific Ocean conducted, being conducted by Chuck Smith and Lonnie Frisbee of Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, which was a big center in Southern California for the Jesus movement. And then also you see a picture of Dennis Bennett, uh, the Episcopal priest who was baptized in the Holy Spirit uh, in the late uh, 50s and announced it in 1960. So uh, really, the, this uh, movement kicked off, so to speak, in a public way um, in 1960 when Dennis Bennett, who was an Episcopal priest, uh, came out to his church and said, I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And at the time, he was the, the rector of St. Mark's Church in Van Nuys, California, Southern California, and he announced this to his congregation. He also announced that other people had gotten baptized in the Holy Spirit in the congregation and that they had spoken in unknown tongues in 1959. So this was truly radical because generally Episcopalians don't speak in tongues. <laughs> At least they hadn't up to that point. So as a result of all this, not surprisingly, Bennett was asked to resign and he did. And then he moved uh, to Seattle, Washington to pastor St. Luke's Episcopal Church. And at the time, the church had very few members and was about to close. But under his leadership, it grew to over 2,000 members. As it turned out, a lot of Episcopalians were ready for renewal. After this explosion in his church, the story was carried in the local newspapers. Various wire services picked it up and the news swept the country. So this isn't just confined to the West Coast, California, Washington State. This is, be, you know, people throughout the nation are finding out about this. And uh, Dennis Bennett was certainly not a person who wanted to become famous. He did not want to be in the public eye. Um, he didn't really like it. Um, you know, it was only help, his popularity and fame, so to speak, were only in, uh, encouraged or uh, grew because of the books he published about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. But certainly when Time Magazine and Newsweek Magazine published stories about this, you know, that was it. His days of hiding under the radar were over. Now, generally, before 1955, the, the religious mainstream did not embrace Pentecostal doctrines. If a church member or a clergyman openly expressed such views, they would usually, either voluntarily or involuntarily, separate from their existing denomination. So in the past, if you had become Pentecostal, if you'd experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit, experienced Holy Spirit gifts in operation, and whatever church you were a part of, whether it was Baptist or Methodist, Lutheran, uh, Episcopalian, Presbyterian, you pretty much had to leave if you wanted to be at all public about it. Now I'm sure there were probably, probably, you know, this has probably gone on, throughout the church's history, there's probably been people who've been profoundly impacted by the Holy Spirit in their personal lives and maybe just haven't said much about it. Um, but, you know, if you were vocal about it, you would pretty much be kicked out of your church. But by the 1960s, many of the characteristically Pentecostal teachings were gaining acceptance in the Protestant mainstream. And so the charismatic movement represents a change so that because many of those who were influenced by being baptized in the Holy Spirit, hearing about spiritual gifts and learning about them and maybe experiencing them in their own lives, they chose to remain in their original denominations and to a large extent the denominations did not kick them out. So this is, this is very different. 
The movement grew to embrace other mainline churches where clergy began receiving and publicly announcing their Pentecostal experiences. And they began holding meetings, again, within their own churches for seekers and healing services that included praying over the sick and anointing them with oil. And again, this is very different practice. Lutherans and Presbyterians in 1962 started experiencing the charismatic renewal. And the Catholic charismatic renewal began in 1967, more or less, at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, although in a sense it was breaking out in other places as well. So not just Protestants uh, are experiencing this, um, it's the Roman Catholic Church, amazingly. Now, who was left behind in the dust, so to speak? A lot of evangelicals, especially Baptists, definitely not open to the charismatic movement, um, and especially uh, primitive or reformed Baptists, very much against it. Over the next few years, however, almost every mainstream uh, Christian denomination, Protestant denomination, was impacted. We're talking about Presbyterians, some Baptists, Lutherans, Mennonites, Methodists, Episcopalians, Roman Catholics, some Eastern Orthodox, actually, and I'll mention a little bit later what the general approach is within the Eastern Orthodox Church to the charismatic renewal. Um, but some of the main leaders coming out of these denominations became almost household names. Lutherans such as Larry Christensen and Harold Bredesen, Anglicans Michael Harper and David Watson in the UK, and, and I should say we're focusing on the United States, but this thing is exploding all over the world. It's certainly not confined to the United States. Roman Catholics Killian McDonnell, Francis McNutt, Edward O'Connor, and later Cardinal Leon Joseph Suenens. Yeah, some of these books are on the shelves in the library. The cumulative effect of Bennett's paperback book, Nine O'Clock in the Morning, John Sherrill's They Speak with Other Tongues, and David Wilkerson's The Cross and the Switchblade, together with numerous magazines and pamphlets, gave the movement credibility and uniformity. By the end of the 60s, the Holy Spirit was on the denominational agenda. But another aspect of the movement led to greater spread and influence than just staying within denominations. The Christian conference circuit offered access to more Christians from every background to hear the message of, char of charismatic leaders. And piggy piggybacking off of the evangelistic crusade idea that was popularized by Billy Graham and others, charismatics began to organize conferences throughout the US and other countries to spread the message that transcended denominational boundaries. TV as well as radio afforded, offered worldwide access to all and would later prove to provide more financial support to a lot of these ministries than what they could obtain locally through local churches. The charismatic movement led to the founding of many covenant communities such as the Sword of the Spirit and the Word of God. Those are Roman Catholic communities, largely but not totally. Um, and there were others that were Protestant, more Protestant in their orientation, but many times very ecumenical. In other words, not confined to one denomination, but welcoming and embracing Christians from a variety of backgrounds. These covenant communities combine charismatic experience with a restorationist impulse. And when I say restorationist, I am talking about the idea of restoring the church to the way it, it, it appears in the book of Acts, what we see portrayed by the apostles in the epistles that they wrote. Um, so in other words, the, the book of Acts experience where people are being filled with the spirit, joining together in communities to live out the Christian life, evangelizing um, and living out their Christian faith in various ways and experiencing spiritual gifts, um, the fivefold uh, ministry gifts, uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, all of this, they wanna see all of this restored within the contemporary church of that time. 
And so many of these communities had people within them who weren't just Roman Catholic or just Lutheran, et cetera. These were people from all kinds of different backgrounds coming together because they, they, they said what we're experiencing is from the Lord and it totally transcends our denominations. We may not necessarily leave our denominations, but we're certainly gonna reach out to other Christians from, uh, with other backgrounds uh, to be a part of this thing. So the word of God, which still exists, is an ecumenical, charismatic, missionary Christian community in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And it was primarily organized by Catholics, but there are a lot of non-Catholics in it. Founded in 1967 by four young Catholics, leadership was provided by Ralph Martin and Stephen Clark as lay leaders. And we may have some books by uh, Ralph Martin on, on the bookshelf in the library. Yep, and that's there too. Um, Martin and Clark were formerly involved in the Curcio Movement Office in Lansing, Michigan. Jim Kavner and Jerry Rauch were involved in charismatic renewal work at the University of Notre Dame and had come to carry out evangelism in Ann Arbor, Michigan after their encounter with the Charis Catholic Charismatic Movement at Duquesne. Now, what is this Curcio Movement? This began in Spain. Curcios in Christianity, um, I won't attempt the Spanish <laughs> name, but it means short courses of Christianity in Spanish, is a charismatic movement within the Roman Catholic Church. And it began in Spain in the 1940s and began with the celebration of the so-called first course that was held from January 7th to the 10th, 1949, at the Monastery of San Honorato in Mallorca. The purpose of Curcios is to show Christian lay people how uh, to become effective Christian leaders over the course of a three-day weekend retreat. So this idea of the retreat becomes popular, withdrawing into small groups to receive teaching, have an intensive experience, and the goal of Curcios was to bring renewal and a, a deeper sense of involvement among lay people within Roman Catholic churches. So the Curcio weekend includes 15 talks called Royos, which are given by priests and by lay people. The major emphasis of the weekend is to ask participants to take what they have learned back into the world on what is known as the fourth day. So you retreat for three days, you learn and grow, and then you take what you learn out into the world on the fourth day. The method stresses personal spiritual development promoted by subsequent group reunions after the initial weekend. Now, it began in Spain, but it spread very quickly to both North and South America. However, until 1961, all cursillos were held in Spanish. But then, of course, as, as it spread in popularity, people, all kinds of people wanted to get in on it. Um, they started holding them in English. The first North American Curcio was held in Waco, Texas, and proved to be very popular and spread throughout the U.S. And by 1981, almost all of the 160 Roman Catholic dioceses in the U.S. had introduced the Curcio movement. The three-day retreat format and the emphasis of the event on spiritual renewal and growth was picked up by mainstream Protestant churches. And Episcopalians uh, and Anglicans and Presbyterians used the Curcio materials and conducted uh, Curcio weekends. Lutherans developed their own uh, program called Via de Cristo, and Mennonites have the Way of Christ. The United Methodist Church developed the Walk to Emmaus. Has anybody ever participated in Walk to Emmaus or Curcio? Yeah, I've been to similar Methodist um, events. Curcios played a very important and foundational role in the Catholic charismatic movement. So at the start, these, uh, you know, a lot of them were Catholic, um, oh, professors at seminaries and Catholic universities. Uh, Ralph Kiefer is one, William Story at Duquesne, uh, which is a Catholic university. 
And it, it so happens that Pittsburgh is not too far away from Steubenville, Ohio. And Steubenville, there's a Catholic uh, college in Steubenville that was very much impacted by the Catholic charismatic renewal, very much. Um, so anyway, in, in the late 60s, all this stuff is going on. And at this particular uh, cursio they went to, someone introduced them to the books, The Cross and the Switchblade, and John Sherrill's They Speak with Other Tongues. Um, and they began to notice this emphasis upon the Holy Spirit and the Spirit's charisms or gifts from the Greek word charis, meaning gift, goodwill, favor, or loving kindness. In February of 67, Story and Kiefer went to an Episcopal prayer meeting, and they were baptized in the Holy Spirit there. And then Kiefer took this back to Duquesne and laid hands on other Duquesne professors. And they also had an experience with the Spirit. And then during a gathering at Duquesne University, uh, students at the Ark and Dove Retreat Center, north of Pittsburgh, more people are asking to have these folks lay hands on them and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so they did indeed receive the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in tongues. Uh, this is, you know, just spreading like a move of God, which it is, of course. Now, in the late 1960s, the Roman Catholic um, hierarchy, the, the, the institutional aspect of the church, certainly they began to realize something is going on here. And some of, now you might expect, they would totally want to shut this down. You know, they'd just be totally opposed to it. And Many of them were not. And a cardinal, Cardinal Leo Joseph Suenens, who was uh, a Bel he was Belgian, um, but, you know, and again, this is spreading all over the world. Uh, this is affecting Catholic churches, not just in North America, but lots of other places. And he was very much on board with it. And he said that the Catholic charismatic renewal is not a specific movement. In other words, this didn't originate with men. This wasn't, you know, a program that we cooked up. Uh, this is not a movement uh, in the usual sociological sense. This is indeed a move of God is what he was recognizing. It doesn't have any particular founders per se. It's not homogeneous. In other words, it's mani manifesting itself differently in different parts of the world, but nonetheless, we recognize that this is a move of the Holy Spirit in all of these places. There are many, many different varieties of experience, a great variety of realities. It is a current of grace, a renewing breath of the Spirit for all members of the church, laity, religious, priests, and bishops. It is a challenge for us all. One does not form part of the renewal. Rather, the renewal becomes a part of us, provided that we accept the grace it offers. So this, this is, you know, certainly not what you would expect. Now, perceptions of the charismatic movement vary within the Roman Catholic Church, although it has been favorably regarded by the last four popes. Proponents hold the belief that certain charismata or spiritual gifts are still bestowed by the Holy Spirit today as, as they were in early Christianity as described in the book of Acts in the Bible and the epistles. However, critics accuse charismatic Catholics of misinterpreting or some, in some cases violating church teachings on worship and liturgy. Traditionalists also often object to the movement. Sorry. <laughs> well, there we go. Uh, some Roman Catholics argue that charismatic practices shift the focus of worship away from reverent communion with Christ in the Eucharist and towards individual emotions and non-liturgical experiences as a substitute. 
And this is often the same objection raised by Eastern Orthodox. Um, someone who is Eastern Orthodox told me, um, you know, we have the liturgy. What do we need all this other stuff for? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, there are varying opinions. And, you know, these, these heavily, what we would think of as heavily liturgical churches, you know, some parts of those churches are open to it, some parts are not. Now, other Catholics maintain that their involvement with the charismatic renewal has revitalized their faith and led them to a deeper devotion to Christ in the Eucharist and a deeper appreciation of the liturgy. Um, despite differences in viewpoints, the Catholic charismatic movement continues today. And, and I mentioned uh, the Word of God community in Ann Arbor. That is still going. There are other uh, Roman Catholic communities that were formed in this period, and they're still going. And the Sword of the Spirit is kind of a, an umbrella organization for a lot of these, and that's still going as well. And the movement has continued to receive institutional support from the Catholic Church. Not, again, not what you would typically expect. In 1972, they set up an office, the International Communications Office in Ann Arbor. In 76, it was transferred to Brussels under the oversight of Cardinal Suenens. Uh, he changed the name to International Catholic Charismatic Renewal Office, quite a mouthful, in 78. The office transferred to Rome and to the Vatican in 81 and 85. So it became part of the, you know, the Vatican machine institution, so to speak. Um, in 1993, they changed the name again to International Catholic Charismatic Renewal Service to emphasize its role as a pastoral ministry service to the renewal worldwide. Um, so again, not surprisingly, it's a move of the spirit. Who can contain it? No human can. But the Roman Catholic Church did want to set up some kind of uh, institutional framework within, to guide, within which the renewal movement could be guided. Four popes have acknowledged the movement. Pope Paul VI, John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and the current pope, Pope Francis. Pope Paul VI acknowledged the movement in 71, reaffirmed it in 75, and he said the movement brought vitality and joy to the church, but also mentioned for people to be discerning of the spirits. So again, the sense is, this is a wonderful move of God. We also need to oversee it. Pope John Paul II was also supportive of the renewal, and uh, many people involved in the charismatic Catholic renewal uh, were conservative politically, and he was very supportive of that. Um, and then John Paul II and uh, also, who was at the time Cardinal Ratzinger, later became Pope Benedict XVI, acknowledged the good aspects of the movement but urged caution, pointing out that members must maintain their Catholic identity and communion with the Roman Catholic Church. So again, some Catholics have criticized this movement and they say, really what this is doing is it's just gonna end up with more Catholics leaving the Catholic Church and joining Protestant churches or becoming Pentecostal. Um, so again, it's not, not viewed favorably in some aspects of the, the church. Now, the 60s were not just a time of innovation and change within religious circles. The larger American society was undergoing radical changes as well. The civil rights movement, the Vietnam War, the development of the pill or oral contraception and making it widely available, radical political movements and the rising feminist movement all combined to bring about a sense, especially among uh, young people, that American institutions were morally bankrupt. Trust in business and political establishments and institutions dropped, and various groups sought to change American life. The baby boomers, these are Americans born between 1946 and 1964, were coming to adulthood by the 1960s, and many more of them attended college than their parents, the so-called silent generation. At the start of the boomer generation in 46, according to the US Census, 
Almost half of the adult U.S. population did not complete high school, let alone attend college. Things were very different for, for the generation prior to the boomers, the so-called silent generation. Uh, most people in that generation left high school if they were fortunate enough to finish high school to go straight to work in factories, farms, mining, and other physically demanding jobs. Okay, now a whole new generation um, is beginning to have the college experience. <laughs> the good, the bad, and the ugly of all of it. <laughs> By 1952, 7% of the population over the age of 25 had a college degree. Now, since most people enter college at age 18, by 64, when the first boomers were entering as freshmen, the per percentage jumped to nearly 9%. By 72, 12% of the adult population over the age of 25 had achieved a four-year college degree. And by 82, the last year that, that the boomers could begin entering college, the number had grown to almost 18%. Now, why is this important that so many more people are going to college compared to generations before them? The, you know, ordinarily you would say, well, that's great. They're getting a college education. They're gonna be able to get better jobs and have better lives. That's awesome. Now, it had kind of an unintended consequence, so to speak. Um, so in addition to the, you know, possible excuse me, possibility of better job opportunities after college, four years of college gave young people the chance to learn about different ideas and points of view that they might never have encountered if they had not gone to college. College campuses in the 60s were hotbeds of radical political movements and ideologies and fertile ground for the anti-war and civil rights movement. Four years of college in the 60s also gave students the opportunity to experiment with, using the conventional phrase, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. So in other words, they have all this leisure time to you know, get drunk, use drugs, go to class or not go to class, um, go to sit-ins, go to uh, protests for, you know, against the Vietnam War, to get involved with all kinds of things that they probably never would have gotten involved in had they just gone to high school and then gone straight into the job world. Timothy Leary, a clinical psychologist and Harvard professor who advocated using psychedelic drugs, popularized the phrases, turn on, tune in, drop out, and think for yourself and question authority. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember there was a time when just about any parking lot you would, you know, you're out shopping, you're whatever, you know, you would, you would see bumper stickers on the back of, backs of cars, question authority. That was super popular. <laughs> Leary's slogans resonated with the hippies, a movement among American youth that, the, that began in the U.S. during the 60s. Now, although begun in the U.S., the hippie movement spread to different countries around the world. Like so many things from American culture, this gets picked up, and these things impact other countries and other cultures. Now, the word hippie came from hipster, not hipster in the, in the way you all currently think of hipster. There was the word hipster before you were even around. Uh, and it, it, it meant something very different. Um, so maybe the word beatnik, you know, I don't know if that has any meaning for you. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> well, these, these were the precursors to the hippies. They were, in, they were into, you know, radical leftist politics and living alternative lifestyles, using drugs. Um, you know, instead, instead of going to work, you know, as a cog in the corporate machine, I'm going to become a musician. I'm going to become a poet. I'm going to just live the bohemian lifestyle and, uh, you know, just enjoy life and create art. And hopefully I'll find a way to make this pay. A lot of them uh, could be cluster, would be clustered in New York's Greenwich Village, in San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury District, and Chicago's Old Town Community. 
And hippies were definitely interested in the alternative lifestyles, and they enjoyed forming communes and communities where they could pursue these lifestyles. Accepted American values and conventional religious, social, and political ideas were rejected by the hippies. They were often interested in self-actualizing. They listened to psychedelic rock music and embraced the sexual revolution, and many used drugs such as marijuana and LSD, and a lot of others, to explore altered states of consciousness. Mainstream American values were rejected, such as attending college and obtaining a degree, or joining the military to fight in the Vietnam War and other imperialistic American military conflicts. The idea of conventional monogamous marriage between one man and one woman was often rejected, as was saving yourself for marriage. That's out the window. And we, and, and we can do that because we have the pill. Very important for them. The idea of holding down a job or having a career was rejected in favor of being a perpetual student, becoming a musician, artist, or poet, traveling the world, exploring different religions, especially Hinduism, Buddhism, and Native American religious thought. Another popular catchphrase of the era was, if it feels good, do it. <laughs> in, 19, in 1967, the human be-in in Golden Gate Park, San Francisco, and the Monterey International Pop Festival popularized hippie culture, leading to the summer of love on the west coast of the US and the 1969 Woodstock Festival on the east coast. Hippies were convinced they would bring the planet into cosmic consciousness and the age of Aquarius in which peace, love, and brotherhood would reign supreme. And that picture up there, um, for some reason, PowerPoint wouldn't let me add a text box so I could I could show the artist's name, but this, this is a, a painting or a poster by the very popular, I guess you could call him hippie artist, Peter Max. Um, so he, he, did a lot of, um, he did a lot of this kind of artwork, and this was very typical for the period. However, the summer of love didn't last very long. By the end of the, <laughs> pretty, much, pretty much just one season, the Haight-Ashbury scene in uh, San Francisco had deteriorated, and many who came to San Francisco ended up living on the streets, drug-addicted, and hungry. Although the hippie movement died in 1967, the youth culture that emerged became fertile ground for many young Americans to become disillusioned with social, political, and religious experimentation, and some evangelical Christian organizations began outreaches to many disaffected young Americans, resulting in the emergence of the Jesus people, uh, sometimes Jesus freaks, they were known as. Young Americans were also impacted by the charismatic movement and joined loosely structured campus prayer groups or evangelical, in other words, non-charismatic college campus groups, such as Campus Crusade for Christ or Navigators. The restorationist impulse behind the charismatic movement, both Protestant and Catholic, was attractive to young people due to its emphasis on restoring the church as it was in the first century AD. And as with the Catholic charismatic movement, the Jesus movement attracted people who wanted more from religious organizations than just Sunday church services. The idea of Christian community appealed to former hippies who had been hoping for peace, love, and brotherhood. And many converts created informal community structures. Over time, many of the, these informal charismatic prayer groups evolved into more structured organizations, and churches emerged from that. <clears throat> now, again, going back to the Christian conference circuit, um, this enabled many new converts to hear charismatic Bible teachers such as Derek Prince, Ern Baxter, Don Basham, Charles Simpson, and Bob Mumford, uh, who later formed uh, a group called Christian Growth Ministries. Over time, new churches emerged, and other churches actively opened their doors to young people coming out of the hippie culture. One such church was Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa, California. Has anybody uh, here seen the movie Jesus Revolution? I think maybe quite a few of us have. 
if you, you know, if you have a chance to see it, you should watch it because um, it really profiles um, it. Uh, the one that came out this year, 2023. Yep. Um, I mean, and there are other similar movies, and you can find lots of film footage that was taken um, at various events and um, uh, on like YouTube, you know, there's vid videos that people took back then of what was actually happening. Whereas Jesus Revolution is a Hollywood made movie, you know, with actors portraying the roles of people like Chuck Smith. Um, so Calvary Chapel today um, is an international association of evangelical churches uh, it came out of, uh, it had Pentecostal origins, and Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, today, that's a pretty big church. At the time, it was pastored by Chuck Smith, and he pastored it from 1965 to 2013, shortly before his death. And Smith had come from the International Church of the Four Square Gospel. So remember, we talked about Amy Semple McPherson and all of what was involved with uh, Four Square Gospel and... Um, so Smith was pastoring this church in Costa Mesa, California, and at the time, uh, it just had 25 older members as numbers. So here's another dying church uh, waiting to be revived. Smith began to take notice of the disaffected, down-and-out hippies that congregated in Southern California cities. And Smith's daughter introduced him to her boyfriend, John Higgins Jr., a former hippie who had become a Christian and went on to head the largest Jesus freak movement in history, the Shiloh Youth Revival Centers, uh, from 68 to 89. Smith began to welcome the hippies, and Higgins introduced Smith to Lonnie Frisbee, the hippie evangelist who became a key figure in the growth of both the Jesus movement and Calvary Chapel. Frisbee moved into Smith's home and began ministering to other hippies and counterculture youth on the beaches. And here is a picture, uh, not a, you know, it's an old picture, um, but this is, uh, Frisbee is on the right and Chuck Smith is sitting on Frisbee's left and it's a group of, um, you know, former hippies, hippies current, currently, um, you know, converted people, non-converted people and all the rest. So Frisbee began bringing home new converts, and after a while, Chuck Smith couldn't house them all in his house. So they rented a house. Um, they called it the House of Miracles for the Jesus Freaks. And people lived there essentially communally. Greg Laurie, a high school student living near Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, was one of the young people reached by Lonnie Frisbee in the chapel's ministry. He'd been experimenting with drugs, and the movie outlines this um, and, and shows, you know, what Greg Laurie was up to at the time. Uh, he was involved with a girl who was also using drugs. And eventually, Laurie and his girlfriend and other friends became Christians through this ministry and were baptized in the Pacific Ocean along with hundreds of other youth through Calvary Chapel's ministry. Okay, and uh, I thought these, these pictures were, you know, just give you a feel for how it was. Um, so the Life magazine cover there, um, uh, that appeared in 1972, it's kind of like Woodstock, but it's Jesus freaks. It's not just people doing drugs and listening to rock and roll. Um, and, uh, you know, there were all throughout California, there were all kinds of events taking place, People were giving, you know, they're, they're taking their Woodstock experience and more or less turning it in, into Christian music festival experience is what's happening. And the, the top left picture, again, that's Chuck Smith and Lonnie Frisbee uh, either having just baptized people or getting ready to baptize them in the Pacific Ocean. Greg Laurie would go on to pastor a group in Riverside, California, that eventually became a megachurch, Harvest Christian Fellowship. And in uh, 2022, Harvest Christian Fellowship claimed a weekly total attendance of 14,560 people, and they had four campuses in different cities throughout California and Hawaii, 
and they conduct services in both English and Spanish. So, um, you know, this movement spawned churches, and in my opinion, I don't even know if we would have nearly as many mega churches as we have today if it wasn't for the charismatic movement. Now, not all evangelical churches welcome Jesus freaks, so of course many of these groups had to start on their own and had to provide more or less their own leadership. Uh, so leaders emerged kind of organically from these groups to lead and teach the Bible and provide some structure to these groups. One of the hallmarks of these new churches was the use and adaptation of contemporary music styles for worship. Christian rock bands and contemporary musicians emerged from the Jesus movement. No, and you probably won't know any of these names. <laughs> only about only Greg and I do. <laughs> Notably, Larry Norman, Barry McGuire, Love Song, Second Chapter of Acts, Randy Stonehill, Randy Matthews, and during the mid 1970s, Keith Green. Secular musicians became Christians and adapted their musical styles to create Christian music. That was folk, folk rock, R&B, soul, jazz, fusion, country, and hard rock. West Coast Jesus Music Festivals began to emerge in the early 1970s, featuring many of the artists list, listed above. And while the music was often loud, set in the outdoor rock music festival venues, the atmosphere was definitely different and attracted large crowds of camping families as well as teenagers and young adults. By 1973, Jesus music was receiving enough attention inside the mainstream media that an industry began to emerge. And by the mid-70s, the phrase contemporary Christian music had been coined by Ron Moore and the first edition of CCM magazine <clears throat> was published in July of 77. All right, so that takes us through um, what I have for today. Um, so <clears throat> whether you like them or not, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the Jesus freaks helped pave the way for experience of Christianity that many people resonate with today. Any questions or comments? <clears throat> 